moderator this evening is Susana Pareto Swap, the founder and executive director of Vanguard Culture, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to advancing San Diego's creative industry workforce. Vanguard Culture provides award winning arts journalism, professional development for creatives, and unique cross industry cultural events. With that, Susana, please take it away. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for taking uh, your evening out to meet with us. Um, I recently joined the board of directors for the San Diego Press Club, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today to this conversation about arts writing. Whether you're an aspiring arts writer or a seasoned professional dipping your toe into arts writing for the first time, we hope that you will walk away feeling empowered uh, to take the next step in your arts journalism journey. And just to provide a bit of context, um, San Diego's arts community is on the verge of a renaissance right now. The state of California recently received a huge influx of federal funding for the arts. It's also the first time in our city's history that the mayor and entire city council is in support of increased arts funding. And as many of you know, San Diego and Tijuana were recently designated World Design Capital 2024. It's the first binational designation, and it's the first American city to receive this honor. So you can expect that there will be plenty to write about as the arts and design community gears up for 2024. 24 celebrations. In partnership with World Design Capital, Vanguard Culture is producing a major visual and performing arts festival this September, bringing together film, theater, dance, visual arts, and music creatives from both sides of the border. So stay tuned and get ready for a very exciting year of arts coverage. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our guest. Kristen Navarre Schweizer earned her Bachelor of Theater Arts at San Diego State University, where she was named the Daily Aztec's Most Valuable Features Writer of 2010. She has worked for San Diego Business Journal, Skatina Daniels PR firm, the San Diego Repertory Theater, and served as cultural chair of the Downtown Community Planning Council. In addition to covering theatrical events for Vanguard Culture, she profiles behind the scenes artists in her Art Scene series, which was awarded first place in the San Diego Press Club's Excellence in Journalism Awards for a feature series light subject in 2022. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you for having me. Um, Elizabeth Rookledge is an independent curator, writer, and educator based in San Diego, California. She previously served as assistant curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego and associate curator at the Katona Museum of Art in New York. In March of 2020, she founded Here in Journal, an online publication for exchange around contemporary art in San Diego. Elizabeth currently acts as editor of the journal and frequently contributes writing and interviews. She also teaches modern and contemporary art history at the University of San Diego. Thank you for being here, Elizabeth. I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Thank you. And Seth Combs is the former arts and music editor and editor in chief at the Alt Weekly San Diego City Bee. He also served as an associate editor at Riviera Magazine covering nightlife, arts, and society. And for the last two years, he's been a regular contributing writer and columnist for the San Diego Union Tribune, covering the city's visual and literary scene, visual arts and literary scene. As a freelancer, he's also contributed to Spin, The Hollywood Reporter, and Zagat. Welcome, Seth. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I brought this uh, group of writers together because of the distinct angle that each of you bring to the table when it comes to arts coverage. So I want to start with you, Kristen. Um, you're part of our organization and you primarily cover theater for Vanguard Culture. And because that's your background, it's your comfort zone, it's your biggest strength. You also write a bi-monthly uh, column called Art Scene, which highlights the behind the scenes creatives who make our city arts, city's arts and culture sector thrive. And what I've really appreciated about your style through the years is your fearlessness when it comes to sharing your genuine voice. Uh, you write with a sense of humor and authenticity, and you often incorporate who you are as a mother and as a theater professional in your stories. I, I wonder, I've always wondered, where do you pull that sense of freedom and, and what advice can you offer to aspiring arts writers on how to incorporate their authentic voice into their writing? Thank you for that kind introduction and um, such a great question. So to answer both of them at the same time, I was lucky enough to start my journalism journey with two years as a humor columnist for San Diego State's Daily Aztec. So I was writing to my peers and I was released from AP style guidebook. I was writing in first person. And then my first paycheck writing job was for the San Diego Business Journal. So that's all AP style book, very uh, by the book, hard facts, just the facts, ma'am. 
And when I went into arts writing, I got to combine those two styles. And along with my sincere love of theater, having been working in the theater as a marketing person before I moved on to there. So I would advise any inspiring writer to try different styles. Even if you know for sure you wanna go into one style, still do other things, still write poetry, still write fiction, still write hard news columns, profiles, and then go back and be a really harsh critic of your work. Because where you see that um, truth and sincerity come together, that is your authentic voice. And that is what you have to polish and showcase until it becomes your brand. Yeah, it absolutely is your brand. I mean, every time that a, a write up comes from you, I can't wait to read it because I know I'm going to laugh. I'm going to be shocked. I mean, there's always something really fun um, that that becomes a part of like, I feel like I know you, you know, and I really do appreciate that in your work. Um, Elizabeth, I'm bring, I want to bring you into the conversation. Uh, your background is in contemporary art, and indeed your expertise in this field is the core strength of your arts journal herein. Your journey, though, has been somewhat unique and has affected the way that you approach arts coverage in, with an increased focus on accessibility for the visually impaired. Can you please share a bit about your journey with accessibility and what you would like to make sure the next generation of arts writers considers in their coverage? Yeah, I appreciate this question so much. Um, you know, I actually had a pretty traditional art history museum track for most of my career. Um, I went to grad school for art history. I was a sort of official museum curator and I thought that that was what my path was going to be forever. Um, but actually a series of um, illnesses sort of derailed that um, in unexpected ways. I have multiple chronic illnesses. I identify as disabled um, and disability really is at the foundation of everything that herein is everything. All of herein's characteristics really boil down to, for me, um, you know, living with with a disability. Um, I started it in March 2020 you know, partially because of the pandemic that, you know, we sort of realized, oh, shoot, like San Diego doesn't necessarily have sort of certain types of digital um, platforms that would that would be really useful here. And that especially in this time of, you know, lockdown um, that yeah. we need. Um, so, you know, that was part of my reason for starting here. And, but the other part was that I had a really serious chronic illness and I wasn't able to work a regular job. And I had a couple of morning, a couple of good hours every morning where my brain was kind of on point. Um, and so I was like, what is something that I can do that I can sort of you know, go with the flow with my illness, um, but that's going to be meaningful and that's going to connect me to my community and that it's going to, it's going to give something. Um, so, so yeah, so the fact like herein does not do hard deadlines, um, herein does not make money. <laughs> um, <laughs> yet. <laughs> we, well, we, we fundraise um, just a, a little bit from the community, um, but, you know, fundraising is really, is not um, part of the package because it's not within my bandwidth, um, you know, and then and then the I think the the part of this that people actually see on the website where the rest of this is kind of invisible, people see that we do image descriptions and image descriptions and alt text. I don't know if people are familiar with kind of the difference, but both of those are um, features of a website that allow people who are living with visual low vision or who are blind um, who use a piece of technology called a screen reader. Um, and so it does exactly what it sounds like. It's text that describes what is in an image so that people using the screen reader can know what's going on. Um, and I actually, when I started here in was looking to other journals that were created by people with disabilities. And so I learned a lot from them. Um, and so, yes, so we feature image descriptions. Um, I have a couple of um, web resources um, that I would love to share in the chat. Um, Please do. I would highly recommend checking these out. Um, I also, I would, I would really like to encourage arts writers kind of moving forward, future arts writers to really think about accessibility, not as an obligation, not as something that's like a duty that's gonna take your time and energy, but rather to think about it as a joy um, and that doing things like writing image descriptions or alt text um, is a way of connecting and of sharing and making sure that the things that you are interested in, the things you love that you're working on are accessible to everybody. 
Thank you. Beautifully said. And it is really so important. There's a there's a big movement in the disability commun community, um, even in, in programs like this, right? So I've seen where they say, hi, my name is Susana. I'm a 40 something year old Latina wearing a red shirt with, you know, silver rimmed glasses and short hair and red lipstick. And then we get started. And there's just something about giving a, a mental visual to someone who doesn't have that opportunity to see the you know the full picture if you will um so what the way your your descriptions are are really beautiful in the in um and, and we put the link by the way of here in journal in the on the website so that you can give it see an example of what a, a, a true image description looks like so thank you for sharing that and if you can also share um potentially if that's available to you or maybe we can email it later if there are any resources where journalists could find this, these types of tools or examples or anything like that that would be very helpful i actually just put thank a couple you. um of my absolute favorites in the chat for you and we can email them as well wonderful thank you for that um seth let's let's bring you into the conversation your role uh in arts coverage has evolved through the years and as someone who's worked on both sides of the aisle as an editor receiving story pitches and as a journalist pitching stories to an editor i wonder if you can share a bit about your journey and anything that you've learned in the process um and like do you feel like being an independent journalist has given you the freedom to pitch stories for the type of coverage that you truly want to cover such as the literary arts for example um good question i um first i just want to say it's it's really great to be here uh with the two other panelists like i, I really really admire uh their work and i'm really glad that elizabeth explained um that uh the alt text because um I didn't know what that was for a good amount of time until somebody pointed it out to me and I was like, oh my God, like, thank you for, so yeah, thank you for for, for sharing that and explaining that because um, I was ignorant of it myself until somebody uh, much smarter than me pointed it out. Anyway, yeah, I will um, answer your questions um, in, in uh, two parts. I would say, yeah, it's certainly not exclusive to me, but I do have um, a somewhat unique perspective of having been on on both sides of the computer, both as a um, starving freelancer and as the uh, person calling the shots at a publication. So um, to answer the first part of your your question, what have I learned and what is my journey? I, I, I a lot. <laughs> <It's been, laughs> um, you know, I've been invited to speak in some college classes and I, I did some work, you know, some freelance workshops at um, San Diego Writers Inc. And, and I've been in the business for over 20 years, so I have a, a very clear idea of how editors operate and what they're expecting, um, depending on the publication or, or website, of course. Um, and, and of course, there's everyone is different and editors vary from, from publication to publication, but um, I would say there are no hard and fast rules to what an editor is like, but there are some sort of core rules that I found when it comes to sort of how to conduct oneself as a freelancer. And I, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, in a little later. But mm -hmm. as for the second part of your question, um, do I like the freedom? Hmm. I mean, it depends on the day you ask, <laughs> really. I mean, yes, it has afforded me the, some freedom to write about what I want, which is, I really value, don't get me wrong. Like I, uh, uh, I, I don't particularly like working in an office, uh, but that being said, um, I, the, the time I've spent with other reporters and creative people within those environments has made me a much better writer. Um, yeah. you know, it's just, if, if you're writing a novel, you want to workshop it with, with people, even if they don't agree with you, like they are often the ones whose, uh, words are invaluable, whose, you know, whose edits are invaluable. So I, I, I would go so far as to say that it does offer, uh, more security to work. Uh, at like a, a news organization or a magazine or a website uh, in the arts department, but you know, but <laughs> that being said, we are arts writers. Our job is never secure <laughs> and not to be like a doubter, <laughs> like, you know, it, it's true, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna keep it real on that one. So yeah, I love, yeah. I'd like the independence, but at the same time, you know, I'm not mm -hmm. above, like if somebody came and said like, hey, we want you to to work at our publication, I I would probably consider it, you know? Yeah, no, I hear you. I, I what's interesting too, and and I started off this conversation with that is that 
things are changing. You know, that conversation is changing in terms of the breadth of, uh, of arts coverage available. You know, um, we need more arts writers and that's why this, this workshop really is more important. But, you know, the, the more, the better. Um, San Diego uh, is promoted um, in tourism as a sleepy beach town, fun hikes, you know, certain sun, sun bathing, all the things. But, you know, I've, I've been very lucky, very privileged to have lived in Paris, London, New York, Mexico City, like art meccas of the world. And San Diego has that type of capacity in terms of its continual arts and especially with the with the border the border region the, the other side of the border is thriving in arts and culture also so that's why san diego tijuana received this designation because of this sort of underground activity happening unfortunately it's not getting as much coverage as it needs to get and um now that everything's uh you know we're expecting a world audience to start paying attention to this region in the next uh, year and a half um, we need arts writers. So thank you all of you for being here, you know, for, for being a part of this conversation. We hope that it encourages you to take the risk. I know that arts writing can seem a little bit daunting for people sometimes. Um, they feel like, oh, well, you know, I didn't technically study music, but I love it. And I go to a million concerts and I'm just someone who's always been passionate about it and I can write, talk about it with my friends. Well, that you can probably take that gamble. You could probably try, you know, and, and, and be a really great music writer. So um, I want to take a, just a quick moment to remind everyone in the audience that you can add your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we are monitoring them and we'll uh, get to as many as we can. Um, Okay, do you have a question for your panelists? Okay, there it is. Thank you, Nicole, for spreading the word. Um, the next questions are directed to the full panel, so please just speak up if this is something that you can speak on. Um, with the recent social justice reckoning, the Me Too movement, artificial intelligence, chat GPT, fake news, there is no question that we are living in historic times for the future of journalism. How do you think arts coverage will evolve, or perhaps how should it evolve? in the years to come. I can call on you if you like. That's a, if you don't mind me jumping in first. Go for it. I, um, I love ChatGPT. And one of the first questions I asked it was, why is human art superior to AI art? And it said, because humans have to struggle, which was fascinating to me. Um, because the title of this panel is Beyond the Press Release. As art journalists, we don't just get the press release and regurgitate it in our own words for our readers. Um, we're not curators just picking the things that readers need to know in the words of the artist. We are giving, we are the filter. And our struggle, our wrestling with the art is what makes it arts journalism and not just arts news, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, what's exciting about what you said with Susanna, about if you really, really love concerts, go to a concert and then write about it and then pitch that story to somebody or just put it on your social media and get those conversations started because that struggle is how you're going to develop your voice. And it is what sets uh, your, your work apart from just PR. That's, that's that human element that tweaks it. And I hope that we will evolve, our journalism should and can evolve beyond the who and what and where to the why. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that I always try to remind our writers is tell me why I need to care. You know, don't just give me the facts. I Anyone can do the facts. facts. I want to know why. I want to, why should I care about this? Why does this story matter? And what, how is it relevant to the society we're living in today? That's, you know, as an as as an editor of my own magazine, that's what I care about. And each one has their own focus. So it might not be for everyone, but that's definitely the thing that I always pay attention to. Seth, Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts on that? Can you can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, this this moment of uh, societal sort of upheaval, the Me Too movement, artificial intelligence, chat GPT, we're living these historic times. How would you like to see arts coverage evolve? How should it evolve in the years to come in that context? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think as far as, as those, uh, those changes, you know, they're, much, they're of course, you know, long overdue and, and slow moving. 
you know, I, I a bit tentative about, you know, speaking to this because I am, you know, a, a, a white passing man, uh, you know, I do consider myself queer, but as uh, that's also been a big, tough journey for me. So that being said, I think I need to first acknowledge that I know, you know, my skin color and my gender has afforded me opportunities and privileges that others perhaps didn't have. That being acknowledged and that being said, I have always made it my mission to be like a good ally. Um, you know, whether it was to take chances on on queer writers or writers of color, I, I write a column in the UT for for going on three years called Art of the City. And, uh, you know, I, I, I started it under sort of a, a, a personal rigid premise of, of bringing attention to visual artists who I considered uh, underrepresented or from communities who are underrepresented uh, in, in uh, media coverage. Another way of saying that is just not white men. Um, <laughs> you know, so speaking to the, to the arts, it is, a, it is a, it, and the arts community is a vastly more progressive and um, community and it's making huge strides when it comes to diversity. But I, I, I believe the makeup of publications and, and editorships um, still has a long way to go and is playing catch up in a lot of ways. I think it's getting there. Um, but what you see more often than not is that, is that those arts editors are um, under the, under the you know, uh, a, a corporate structure sometimes and the person at the top is still white men. But um, I don't know, the, the, the entire, you know, I, I, oh, it's, you know, it, it, I do see things getting a lot better. And I think that there are a, a, a lot of opportunities uh, especially when it comes to like social media. Um, and so I, 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 while I feel the power structures might change, it's still highly problematic. Like any organization that is rooted in these things, it's systemic and it's going to, it's not going to change overnight, but I'm very optimistic about it. Yeah. And as arts writers, you know, it's our obligation to continue pitching those types of stories. You know, they don't, they won't, if, if you sort of cover the circles that you're in. And so if it is led primarily uh, by white men, as you say, then they're not hanging out with the folks that have the, these stories, you know, the BIPOC folks with these stories. So it's our obligation to continue sharing, hey, did you know this woman who's doing this amazing thing? And did you know, you know, um, otherwise they won't be exposed to it uh, as easily. Um, Elizabeth, did you want to say anything about this? Sure. Um, so I feel like I need to give the caveat that I emphatically do not identify as a journalist. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. and, and I'm sort of a, a little uncomfortable even with the term coverage. Like, Kristen, I don't know what the AP guide is. Like, I don't know what that is. Um, I come from an art <laughs> history background and I identify as an art writer. It just stands um, for Associated Press. That's all. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, because I don't, um, I don't consider myself to be objective in the least, and I don't want to be. I want to write about art that I love, art that I am obsessed with, and I want that to come through in my writing. Um, and I really set up here in to make room for that, because I know that when people are working for publications that are sort of journalistic, there's there's a different, um, I don't know, set of responsibilities that I even don't fully understand. But I found myself as a curator, as someone who was writing for museums, you know, I have all of these different sort of facets of my relationship to art that I was not able to write about or communicate about, things that are personal, things that have to do with my position positionality in the world, with my emotional life. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just have been really, I think for many years, hungry for those kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to, to make a space for that with herein. And I think that it, it has, um, I think that's gone well. I think even in my own writing, when I look at sort of how I was writing when herein first started to how incredibly personal my writing has become, uh, it, it's a big change. And, you know, I understand that this is probably not um, feasible for many of the journalists in the room, but I think any time writing about art is just a little bit more personal, um, that's that's what I want to read. I mean, I think everyone here would agree that that's what we all want to read, right? I mean, we want to we want to know the human story behind, you know. Again, going back to the why, um, 
if you just regurgitating a press release, okay, you know, well, thanks. <laughs> it's we're we still appreciate it though, you know, we still appreciate the coverage if that's all you can offer. But, but um, you know, we're just in, inviting people to take that extra step and try to see if you can find uh, a deeper meaning behind it for you personally. And and I think people just love to hear that. They they love to know. And even if, for example, in our in our in our um, arts magazine, we don't, you know, there are we have writers that are very focused on theater or very visual arts or very, you know, music or dance, and that's really their passion. Um, but I invite even a dance fanatic to go to an art show, you know, to go to a visual arts show and say, go cover that. And there, and it's okay to be completely sincere and humble and say, in your writing, I don't really know much about this, but it moved me because it had this and this and these components and 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 almost speaking to it as a layman, but connecting to the re to the reader for that exact reason, because it's giving almost giving the audience like permission that even if you're not a, you know, if you don't speak art speak and you're not, you know, a great contemporary art, a contemporary art, you know, fanatic or uh, professional, you can still go and enjoy and have a wonderful time and, and get something out of it that's meaningful to you. So crossing across different industries for me is is in coverage is always really exciting. Thank you. Let me um, check in there though. Yeah, uh, please. I've been writing for Vanguard Culture for eight years. And like I said, I came from the San Diego Business Journal. Like you want to know everything. And you sent me to the San Diego Opera, um, which I'd never been to the opera before. All I knew about the opera was Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman. So I did all this <laughs> thing and I was going to pretend I knew the difference between an aria and a cantata. I don't even remember. I did all this research and I went in and I talked to, I want to say it was the LA Times journalist was seated next to me. And I was just thinking, why would I just write a little bit worse of a straightforward critique? There's enough noise on the internet. We don't need two of this. And so I yeah. looked at the audience and said, wow, I'm the youngest person of color in the orchestra section. And I wrote a, like almost a BuzzFeed style listicle, five reasons why millennials should try the opera. And it was just almost a humor column take, a respectful awe filled for the art form I'd never experienced article. And that was what I submitted and fortunately yeah. collected enough to run it. Um, and it was wildly shared by the San Diego Opera. They loved it. They shared it and shared it and shared it because they just thought it was so fun, you know, tongue in cheek, quirky, and hilarious. And I think the I think the article it might have been this one or maybe another one that was uh, why you should take your husband to the opera. Was it that one? Maybe maybe it was that one. Um, but it, but anyway, it was like top ten reasons. Same thing. Very very simple and to the point. Um, Seth. Yeah. Oh no, I I just wanted to 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 it sort of piggyback off that and agree with it because it it's one thing that I've always found is so true in 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 doing this is you you will write something and think that it's like the best thing you've ever written and your editor will come back and be like this is shit I'm sorry <laughs> I, mean, I, I this is probably a PG thirteen uh, panel so it's fine I'm uh, sure it's fine we're all grown up yeah and then like you will write something that you think is like a complete like throwaway or whatever you know maybe not a throwaway but just you're like yeah this is I right. and then you'll send it and it, it gets shared wildly and the editor loves it and you know yeah, yeah. It's, it's really like there's no there's I feel like there's some rhyme or reason to it but it's it's wild sometimes yeah it can be hit or miss but you know. Um... I think if you're being respectful, right, to the organization and 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 you really feel like they someone can take away something meaningful from the story in any in any way, shape, or form, whether it's the top 10 version or whether it's uh, you know, I I got a babysitter in order to be here and this better be dang good, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is. Um, I think people really it resonates with people. The human, the just the human connection portion of it, you know, to be fearless about that and having an uh, having a voice, having a voice. Um, so I want to keep. Looks like there's a lot of chat activity. So Nicole, please do tell, let us know if there's any if there are any questions that we can. Um, Absolutely. Actually, I would love to cut in. And I do have a question from Marty, um, who's curious about how, uh, or excuse me, who was the team and the PR professionals who worked on the proposal that landed San Diego and Tijuana the designation as a World Design Capital 2024? 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I couldn't tell you who the PR people were um, because I actually don't know who the PR people were, but this was uh, uh, put together through UCSD, um, the Burnham Center for Community Advancement, and oh, there's a third group. Um, UCSD, Burnham Center for Community Advancement, and oh, uh, I want to say San Diego Design Week or the, the entity that uh, I think it might might have been the San Diego Architectural Foundation. I might be wrong on that third one. I know there was a third entity. Um, but yeah, really exciting. And it's been a binational effort, of course. Incredible things have had to happen in order for this designation to happen. I mean, mountains were moved in order for these two governments to work together to make this possible. And that alone, uh, I was a part of the committee uh, in the early in the early um, days of the once we received the designation, once we were in the running for the designation, I was a part of this committee. And uh, even if we had not gotten the designation, all of the partnerships that were forged because of this designation, even that it was worth it just for that alone, because of the because of the the collaboration that happened across the borders. It was just it was just a beautiful effort. So it's something really to be proud of, and there will be more more information on that to come. Any other questions out here before? Oh, there it goes. Design Forward Alliance, UCSD Design Lab, and the Burnham Center for Community Advancement. There it is, with supports from the cities of San Diego and Tijuana. Thank you, Arturo. That's super helpful. Thank you, Arturo. Susana, Amanda also has a question. Making a story personal can definitely make a story better, but we've probably all read stories with too much of the writer and or meta narrative. Oh, Amanda must have been in my classroom. Any tips from the panelists on keeping things well balanced? That might be a Seth question, I think, because as an editor, you probably had some of those. It's open to, uh, to all. Yeah, of there's, there's nothing wrong with writing. And I write sometimes in first person, I just, uh, the only the only rule that I really have had as an editor was not to write in second person. I hate it. That's just a personal style thing. But yeah. when somebody refers to you or your, I I find that to be very, um, I don't know. I, I, I It makes it sound like you're trying to be friends with them or something, as opposed to like a reader service, like, I, I I don't know. I it, I understand that it's it's quite popular, uh, and I might just be old fashioned. But um, I think that it, if you want to to write from a more personal perspective, um, you can use first person. I would just if it fe <laughs> go with your gut. If it feels like you're you're embellishing or you're talking about yourself too much, you probably are. Right. You know? And. I've done that. Like I have been, I am very guilty of at times, like, you know, putting way too much of myself into something and I have to reel it, reel it back. That's probably because I do consider myself a journalist. And I had that sort of like beaten into my head at school, like, you know, proverbially speaking, I didn't, wasn't literally beat, but like, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I, I was told more often than not, you have to be objective. You have to be objective, but right. It's hard to do that when it comes to like writing about arts that we love and writing about books that we love and 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 operas that we love for that matter. So um, yeah, I would just say like just just trust your instincts if it feels. I mean, if you're on like a, a, a your own blog, you know, first person away. But like if you're if you're writing for another um, a publication or website, I would I would consider just maybe like you know. Uh, you know, have fun with it. it you know, it, it, it depends on the article, obviously. But yeah, just if you feel like you're too much, it probably is. Mm. Sorry, I'm just long with it. No, I think that was good. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Then we'll come back to more questions from Q and A later. Um, <clears throat> I had a question about what you would say to someone who wants to cover an area of arts and culture but feels intimidated to try. So, you know. Um, this makes me think of you, Elizabeth, is, you know, when you have someone who really loves contemporary art, but maybe they didn't study contemporary art, I mean, should they feel intimidated to even go try? I mean, or or would you encourage this person? How should an aspiring arts writer sort of prepare for something they've never tried before, for an area they've never covered before? Yes. I mean, I think the word intimidated is perfect because 
people feel just completely, I mean, to say they feel daunted is an, is a understatement. You know, I think people feel very shut out of the contemporary art world. They feel like it's elitist, like you have to have a really specific kind of background, you know, whether that's education, whether that's class. Um, and I feel like my, one of my jobs as editor of herein is to give people permission to write about art, but also just to sort of consider that your, your ideas and your opinions might be valuable, that they are valuable. Um, and what I really encourage people to do, you know, I, I probably wouldn't, you know, even if you have a journalistic practice, um, I wouldn't necessarily just start out pitching a piece before you've really ever written about art. I would start writing about art for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. well, you know, reading about art, reading all different kinds of things, um, but start writing about art for yourself, go to shows, maybe go to MCSD and pick one work of art and do a free write and then take it home and develop it into some kind of piece really just for yourself over the course of like a couple of weeks. Um, and really, so to get into an art writing practice, I think is incredibly valuable and to give yourself the room to learn and to experiment. I mean, like what Kristen was saying before about, you know, you should be sort of trying all of these different kinds of, of writing. I think that that applies to even, you know, writing under the, the art umbrella. Yeah, that's such a good idea really is just do it, just write. Write and write and write as often as you can. I love that. Um, this is another question for the full group. Uh, what has been the most challenging piece of arts coverage that you've ever written and why? How did you tackle that challenge? <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you two and for different reasons. Um, one uh, has to do with my lack of knowledge um, uh, on the part that I was, uh, I basically the the I went I was the main food critic for like a hot minute at uh at, at Riviera slash uh, modern luxury here in San Diego and you know chefs are artists and and I would consider it like a form of art writing and I'm I'm don't get me wrong like I'm I'm pretty adept in the kitchen and I, but I have no business writing about food I I, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I think uh the second one would be um when I was, I was assigned not too long ago, I didn't pitch it, but I was assigned to do a, um, uh, a story about a Jeff Kuhn sculpture in one of the Rady's hospitals. And um, I didn't think there was any, if anybody knows, doesn't know who Jeff Kuhn's is, he's a sculptor, artist. Um, he uh, did the very famous, uh, the balloon dog sculptures. Uh, and um, one of them was broken recently in a, Art Basel, I believe. Um, anyway, I never thought in a million years that he would agree to an interview with some reporter in San Diego, but he did. And um, so he has this sculpture in one of the hospitals, and I, I, I was interviewing, and I, and I, I asked what I thought was a very simple, straightforward question about what was the inspiration for this particular sculpture, because uh, it was one of a, a series of party hat sculptures that he had done, huge, huge sculpture, and he said. Uh, oh, you know, it was inspired by my son. And I think I'm going to get this very heartwarming story. And he just starts going off on this belligerent tangent about his about his uh, ex-wife and how horrible she is. And <laughs> you know, like, how do you know? And I'm I'm playing therapist. This is a very, very famous artist. It was very awkward. So those were uh, I mean, I know those were very anecdotal, but how, how did you handle those two pieces? So you you went oh, ahead I, with the... I didn't put that in piece. I didn't put the I didn't put, you know, I didn't write an article saying Jeff Cahoon goes off on local hates reporters. his wife. <laughs> his yeah. wife. Oh no, I mean he used very, very colorful language, very problematic I, language. I I think that story has also been written multiple yeah, times. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sure it has. On that note, like I, you know, prob I would have loved to have written that story, but it just this was a very like straightforward news piece about um you know, a sculpture that was unveiled at a hospital. I, you know, it wasn't, wasn't that forum, you know? So, um, yeah. but uh, yeah, as, as far as how I had, and as far as the food stuff, like, yeah, like I, I, I did it. I did it for like four or five issues. I was told that I did a great job. Um, much like, you know, uh, Kristen's, you know, opera 
uh, experience. You, you know, you just go into it and you you have ears, eyes, and in this case, taste buds and an opinion, and it worked out. Yeah. Well, don't feel intimidated to keep writing about food. I mean, if it is if it is your passion, what you love, that's what, that's the message we want to get out here. Elizabeth, I do think sometimes it is helpful to acknowledge your own limitations, um, and that maybe not everything is your jam. Um, but I can say that I, for me, and this was something I had to do more when I was working for museums, not so much with Huron. Um, but for me, it's always the most challenging when I am tasked to write about an artist that uh, I am not super interested in their work. <laughs> I try to be broadly curious. I am interested in so many things, but there are artists who are making work that is great that just, I don't, I don't, I'm not obsessed with it. Um, mm -hmm. So that can just be challenging to kind of, you know, get something on the paper that, that you can stand behind and that is good. And um, frequently I deal with that by trying to sort of transport myself into the artist's position and, and think of them first and foremost as a human and think about what mm. this work that they make is doing for them um, and why, why it matters, why they're dedicating their entire life, their entire practice to this thing. Um, so to, to sort of, you know, leave the, um, I don't know, as objective as I get, I guess, um, which is not very, but try to leave like the art historical sort of stuff just to put that on a shelf and sort of center myself in the humanness of artistic practice and that that's really the foundation of what art making is. And that just gives me a kind of attitude shift um, that allows me, I think, then to, to write more easily and to be more excited about it. That's so beautiful to focus on the humanness of it. And, and I think that can probably go across, you know, uh, all industries is you know remember these people are passionately dedicating their lives to this so what what is the why for them even if it's not as interesting for you that's interesting uh Kristen did you have anything to share sure I would say something that continues to be challenging um is when I go into uh see a show especially a comedy and it's a dead room the, the difference between theater and film is very much the interaction between the audience and um, and the uh, the players and no two plays are alike there's always just a little bit different and it can especially during a comedy just be because you have a great room or because you don't and when I first started having children when I started making humans I really was limited to matinees <laughs> and that's just not a great time to see a comedy. I mean, I see why we do it and it's not a bad time, but comparatively an evening performance of a comedy and a daytime performance, the room really matters. And so what I have done is I will out of my own pocket or if I can beg, borrow and steal a ticket, I will go see the show again. Like if I can tell that this show didn't come off the way I could tell the director intended it or I found myself very bored or I really didn't like it. I ask myself a lot why, and I give the piece of art another chance if I can. So that's wow. something I would offer any writer, whether it's performing arts or visual arts, check your mood. Were you in a bad mood before you walked into the museum? Mm. Because you're bringing a lot of yourself into it, even if you are writing not in first person and you are doing a straight news piece. Um, art is incredibly, incredibly personal. And we need, I wrestle all the time with, was that bad or do I just not agree with what they were saying? Wow, well, that's so generous of you. That's so <laughs> I mean, generous of you to come back um, and give it a On minute. that note, um, eat, eat a full meal before you go to museums. Yeah. Wear comfortable shoes. Yeah, don't be grumpy. Don't walk in grumpy. Um, so we have, oh gosh, we're, less than 15 minutes out so um i'm gonna move into let's see if we have a i'll take a question from the audience let's see nicole which one can you suggest thank you, nicole? Thank you. yes kaz has a question i write papers for peer-reviewed journals about my personal work and aesthetic values i live in a very niche world but would like to connect with more diverse people do you have any advice on connecting arcane subjects with the general public that, that's interesting. I'd, I'd be very, I'm very curious as to what the, the arcane subject is, um, if there's any way that Kaz can, can, can mention it. 
Um, great, but like no, I, I I think that there are a lot of um, subjects like that 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 we feel that like oh gosh, like would anybody else be interested in this? And and absolutely, like the, the I, you know one of the the biggest pieces of of advice that I've I've given to to interns and and other writers over the years is is if it's interested if it's interesting to you, there are going to be hundreds if not thousands of other people who find it interesting as well. So um, I, I think the the challenge really is uh, putting it into a, a a form that is accessible to to the average person because you know, I, I had a, 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 a writer uh, who wrote a book the other day, try to explain quantum physics to me. And I was just, my head was spinning, but he wrote about it in his, his new book in a way that made it extremely uh, accessible and wrote about it in a, from a very personal perspective. So I think that that's very important too. Like if you are able to convey what that particular arcane subject means to you, that goes a long way. Okay. Seth, I have a Actually, follow up for you actually. Unfortunately, this the, the words don't do it justice. Kaz messaged us and said it's mathematical, visual, poetry. Um yeah, I remember Kaz. Yeah, okay. Uh yeah, Kaz uh I think I feel, believe I spoke to him about a uh, a um exhibition they did on mathematical poetry uh, art at the uh, Bonita Museum if I if I, if I remember correctly. Well, if I can sort of- I think I've met Kaz myself <laughs> at one of our events as well. Um, go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, if I can just give my, my very specific tip that I have for this, because yes, like I work in academia, I write about contemporary art. There definitely is, you know, an art speak, um, international art English, they call it. Um, and it, it can be challenging to sort of, you know, transition to a, a more general audience. And, and my tip, and it's something I use myself all the time, is to choose a, a specific person, a specific actual person in your real life who you know, and think about um, that as the person that, that you're writing for. So for me, mm -hmm. um, that person is my mom. She likes art, um, but she does not have an art specific education. And I know that for her, if she were to read something that was full of jargon or even a little bit of jargon, she probably would roll her eyes and put it down. And so I think, mm -hmm. about, hey, if I'm writing this in this way, is this gonna be accessible to her? And even more importantly, is it gonna be interesting to her? So for you, that it could be a friend, a colleague, a family member, um, but it's it's helpful to think of one person as opposed to this kind of amorphous um, blob of, of the public. Hmm. That is so well said, thank you. And do you wanna share that uh, about your writing workshops, by the way, this is probably oh, yes. a good moment. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, um, for herein, I do something called the herein writers workshop that takes place every summer. Um, folks have to apply. They send writing samples and a CV and I select a small group and we work together over the course of the summer to develop um, written pieces that are then published in herein. Um, so yes, the application is now open. It's on our website and it is due May 1st. So please, please check that out. It's a lot of fun. It's chill, but um, just a total joy and you'll learn a lot. Thank you. And um, I, I did want to follow up uh, with Seth on something that you brought up, which is, uh, you know, with the literary arts, right? So it takes dedication to go through a full book if it's not <laughs> something that's really exciting, right? So how do you move through a book, a literary works that turn out to be a disappointment versus those that truly compel you? Like how is covering the literary arts or different or the same as covering the visual arts for you? Um, yeah, I, I, I'll answer the first first question. Well, I, I, what I really do uh, with, with uh, literary arts just as with visual art is I, I wanna cover uh, local creatives, especially, um, you know, when it comes to to literature, which includes, of course, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, graphic novels. So I'd say first I find the book or the author. Author, uh, I contact them or their representation, and and sort of go from there. More likely than not, I haven't. I do get books sort of and galleys sent to me, but uh, more often than not, I find I find them sort of more organically, and it, it is sort of similar in that regard to to visual arts. However, visual arts. 
is obviously much more, um, you know, you have to go out, you know, <laughs> it's one thing to see an artist's work on Instagram. It's, it's quite another thing to, to see it in their studio or see it in a gallery or, or even a museum for that matter. So, you know, books is a much more sort of solitary sort of like, hey, like I can just be here and read this or whatever. Um, and then to, to answer your other question, I, I, I'm, I, I think you would know uh, if you if if you read my articles, you'll know when I like a book. Um, I don't like all the books that I cover, but I I think to to what Kristen was saying earlier is that it's really important to, you know, sometimes and I'm paraphrasing, of course, take a step back and realize that this is somebody worked hard on this. And, and while I'm certainly snobbish or, or guilty of being snobbish in my opinions, like I do you know, recognize the fact that they put this out in the world. And that's when I will write something that's a much more sort of straightforward without, you know, perhaps embellishing or, or using, you know, fancy adjectives, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I always wondered about that. I'm like, wow, he's really moving through all of these books. But they can't all be good, you know? <laughs> I, um, no, they're not. <laughs> but, I, I, but, I, but at the end of the day, like, I mean, you know, there, there, there was, you know, there was one recently that was, that was fantastic. And I, I think what you can do is, 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 is embellish a bit and, 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 and really one of the biggest like highlights, rec like recent highlights was picking up a paperback in the airport of a book that I had had written about. And I was like, oh, I never like actually bought this. I'd love to support the author. And it was, mm -hmm. it was just released in paperback. And one of my quotes was in the book, you know, from, oh, you know what I mean? Like that's great. like a really cool feeling, you know? So that's, and that's what you're all giving back by being writers of art, right. the arts is you're giving the our artists the tools to promote their work. And so it's really important work that you're doing. I have one follow-up question uh, for Kristen for art for, covering performing arts um and you know Kristen your background in, in theater has given you the tools to speak confidently and eloquently about the nuances of th that make the theater community tick how has your role as a journalist influenced the way that you experience live theater now so are you still able to suspend disbelief and enjoy the storyline or do you find yourself sort of stuck analyzing the the technical elements of the performance um when I first started, I was paralyzed by the idea that I had to write, and it was incredibly difficult for me to transport myself. So I did two things. The first thing is, um, usually if you're covering theater, if you're invited by the theater, they will give you a plus one. And my plus one must not be a theater professional, because most of my friends are. And I only invite my friends who are not, because uh, that's when you're in shop talk and it affects your ability to be a, a good audience member. So I'm careful to do that. Um, the second thing I do is I, I barely write notes because <laughs> if it doesn't occur to me two hours later, it probably wasn't that meaningful. These <laughs> theaters should stick with you. Um, and those two things have helped me submerge myself into the story and to be an audience member. And again, it's not the who, what, where, it's the why. What is this adding to the community? Not just did the actors hit their lights. And uh, that was great. And then I also remember I was lucky enough to work at Skatina Daniels and the San Diego Repertory Theater, which are a theater company and a PR firm. So I know how it feels the next day to open the paper or Google your show the day after opening and read everything. And I will always respect the exchange that comes between journalists and the writers and the artists, because we don't get to look each other in the eye, but this is my way of saying, I see you and thank you. And that's why I love Vanguard culture because it's so many different kinds of writers coming together to say, I see you. And that's why my mm -hmm. column is called Art Scene. And I encourage all writers to always submerge themselves in the, in the writing not to just try to say something clever or to pursue their, what they're trying to say, but to really look into that why. And if you do that, you can submerge in the story. Mm, thank you. Well, that's a great way to end this conversation. There's so much more that we didn't touch on and there's so many questions, but we're two minutes out. So I need to pass the torch 
back to Nicole. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it. This is a very thoughtful discussion and I think that everyone's gonna really get a lot out of it. Thank you so much.